is about uh, the fact that it's 2015 and we're still talking about cross-site scripting and we're still talking about SQL injection. And that was a perfect uh, introduction uh, earlier to that uh, idea. So I got to thinking, what is the, you know, what's going on here? We're all smart people. These are well understood problems. Um, yet, here we are still wrestling with the fact that um, I think you'll see a statistic later, 96% of um, web applications are found to have uh, some vulnerability in them. So um, some of the points we want to make tonight, there's a number of reasons why I think that's the case as uh, we began thinking about this. Uh, we're heading into a new risk kind of uh, terrain where uh, the risk level is higher than it's ever been before, making our work more important than it's ever been before. Um, we've faced as an industry a similar challenge in the past. We'll try and draw some uh, parallels to that. We'll draw some lessons from that, I hope. Um, and I think you'll find that, um, I'll try to convince you, that success here is going to require a broader focus, perhaps, than we've uh, uh, given it in the past. And ultimately, um, I think it's good news because I see some of these things starting to happen already. So here's sort of an agenda for the talk. We'll talk a little bit about where we are right now as an industry, where we're headed, uh, some of the amusing things that we're starting to see happen. Uh, that's really not so much predictions as evolution of the present uh, happening right in front of us. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the consequences of failure, particularly going forward. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time examining why have we not been successful thus far. Uh, we'll, one of those reasons, by the way, is that application security is hard. I don't have to tell anybody in this room about that. But uh, we'll look at some of the reasons why it's hard and some of the other challenges we face. We'll uh, look at software quality and try and um, draw some parallels between that and software security. Uh, specifically, what was done over the past 30 years to, uh, to improve software quality to the point where we no longer consider it a, a crisis as we did back in the day. Uh, we'll look at the lessons uh, that come out of that. We'll look at where specifically in the software development life cycle we can do things differently. Um, this may not be, um, I don't know, shocking, but it, you will find, I think, that you're not doing a lot of these things in your day-to-day -day, uh, operations in your uh, organizations. And we'll also use that as an opportunity to kind of plug some of the OWASP projects that Tom was uh, talking a little bit about, those 150 projects. I would say that that's one of the um, best kept, you know, it's one of the, um, I don't know, best kept secrets in um, application security is the wealth of uh, value that's in the, uh, the OWASP uh, portfolio. So we'll take a look at that and how it fits into uh, where we think things should be going. And then finally, we'll finish up with some random observations um, and perhaps some predictions. Okay, current state. Um, kind of gloomy uh, synopsis of where we're at. Clearly, we are not doing things right the first time. We're not getting it right the first time. Um, if uh, you were to not know that this was our industry and you were to look and say this is the success rate of some industry, you'd certainly not want to buy their products, right? You'd be a little bit uh, concerned about that. Uh, what's interesting to me about that last one is that not only are we not building things right, but when we do get breached, we don't even know it in many cases uh, for some time. Um, the, certainly the financial um, costs of uh, breach are growing. And uh, as Lance said earlier, you just have to turn on the news. I think he told us not to turn on the news. You turn on the news and, um, you know, it's just the ink isn't dry on these slides before some other breach is, is announced. So, uh, so here's just some statistics. These latter two are a little bit disturbing, I think. Um, well, the first two means that two-thirds of companies uh, are moving secure information and have no way of classifying it, tracking it, or controlling it. Um, that makes me nervous. Uh, the latter two uh, statistics mean that uh, they're not really going after the weak links in the organization. They're not really necessarily trying to find uh, the, uh, the problems before they find uh, us. Where are we heading? Well, we're certainly heading for more breaches. I don't think um, I'm telling anybody anything out of uh, school here. We're heading for the Internet of all things, right? So your television, your alarm system at home, your refrigerator, all of these things are going to be plugged into the internet. And with the same success that all your other internet devices are plugged into with regard to security. Okay? So as we, again, this is evolution of the present. Robotic solutions are going to become pervasive, right? I saw an article today, sorry, I saw an article today that said that um, they're going to be deploying in 2016, they think, robotic 
police officers that write tickets, tickets, okay? Not Robocop, but sort of a telebot, where there's somebody back in the, I don't know, command pod doing this, that, and the other thing, and the robot's walking down the street writing tickets, okay? So this stuff is here. Drones are here. Pilotless vehicles are here. And we're going to continue to see more and more of that, right? We're going to see uh, uh, the driverless vehicles. We're going to see the driverless, uh, perhaps, uh, pilotless planes. We're going to be seeing some uh, advances that our children will take for granted, but we perhaps would not be, you know, the first one to jump on board. Uh, what that means is that there's going to be ever more sophisticated software embedded in ever more things uh, around us. It certainly means that uh, we're going to have increasing dependence on internetwork devices. I read another article uh, today. It said they're introducing, Mattel is introducing a Hello Barbie. And this Hello Barbie connects to the internet. It does voice recognition. And it actually has a real conversation with the child that is playing with the toy. I also read in the same article that uh, a product like that was introduced in the UK about a year ago. And a gentleman by the name of uh, Ken Monroe hacked it and extended its vocabulary. <laughs> and there's some pretty hilarious um, footy, uh, YouTube videos for Kayla, K-C-A-Y-L-A, uh, uh, the talking doll uh, on the internet. So, you know, these are, not, uh, these are not predictions. These are things that are happening right in front of us. So what does it mean? It means that vulnerabilities in our critical infrastructure, vulnerabilities in any one of these systems, becomes life and death. This becomes, uh, you know, the point where uh, uh, malicious actors could actually uh, take, take life through software hacking. Um, you know, I mean, you, you're familiar with the, um, what was it, uh, what was that show on TV um, where they, the president, the vice president and the heart attack scenario, what was that show? No, it wasn't House, was it, it wasn't House of Cards. Was it House of Cards? Homeland, yeah, it was Homeland, exactly. That's just the kind of thing that we're, uh, we're concerned about. Um, so consider loss of faith in the world financial system. Not a far-fetched thing. We've had people stand, not on this stage, but on other OWASP uh, meetings, talk about investigations that took place uh, at the NASDAQ and things like that. Um, just let's use our imagination for a minute. A crypto locker type attack on a commercial aircraft where it shuts down systems, or on the FAA that's controlling the airspace, right? This is not completely crazy. Um, we find out that all stock market, market trades during a certain time frame were manipulated. We find out that more than a billion dollars were stolen from more than 100 banks worldwide. Oh, wait a minute. Wrong slide. That just happened this week, right? People read about that? Yeah, what's it, the Carbonac thing? Where, um, again, it was malware. It was per uh, persistence. It was, uh, it was probably the largest bank robbery, certainly, that's ever taken place in history. And um, that's going to be a game changer, I think. When we get to predictions, we'll talk about what that means. But you can't lose a billion dollars and keep doing business as usual, right? At least not around my house. Um, OK, so that's the consequences of failure. Let's talk a little bit about why haven't we been successful in trying to build secure applications. First and most obvious one is web application development is hard. Um, there aren't enough qualified developers. Development is a, a long uh, road of uh, acquired skill. Uh, security is not an integral part of developer training. I was uh, t talking out front earlier before the talk, and we are joking about, you know, you pick up the book uh, ASP.NET in 21 days. Well, security must be the 22nd day because they don't talk about security and how to build secure uh, applications or how to do uh, you know, encoding, how to do input validation. They don't talk about uh, SQL injection. They don't talk about a lot of that stuff because they're focused on the core programming skill, which I guess is OK. But if you never get to the security part of things, then you have a developer stable that doesn't really know how to build secure applications. And it's simply not sufficient to be coming back to them time and time again and say, well, we scanned your code and we found these cross-site scripting errors. You need to do this to fix it. And then three months go by and you scan their application and come back and say, here's some more cross-site scripting things. You know what I mean? It's, we've got to nip this way back in the, in the early stages. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. There aren't enough qualified security staff. Uh, I read one article that said there's, they estimated 300,000 person deficit worldwide. Another article said it might be as high as a million, okay? So there's a, a voracious appetite right now for, for the right skill set, 
the marketplaces and providing it. Which is good, by the way, if you're in the field, because it means <laughs> salaries are going to stay high, there's going to be salary growth and that kind of thing. Employment opportunities look bright, that's all good. But if you're trying to secure your systems, you're trying to secure your enterprise, this poses some, some real challenges. Some other points. The solution here is not purely technical. Now, we happen to be technical people, so we look for technical solutions. We look for tools. Um, there's a saying that when um, you know how to use a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail, right? Well, we, we sometimes find ourselves looking for that magical combination of tools that will solve our problems. Now, tools are important, don't get me wrong. They have a role to play, as does the education of the people driving those tools. But I also think we need to look more broadly at the, the, the wider scope of the software development life cycle, saying what else can we be doing at various points throughout to make sure that um, uh, we're, we're addressing security completely. It takes time to improve complex processes. Security application development is a complex process. The threat surface is enormous and not limited simply to the application domain, which means that all the other aspects of IT security have to be addressed as well by the organization. We're going to focus right now just on app security, but that point remains uh, quite uh, salient. Uh, the consequences for non-regulated companies is mixed, and I'll um, tell you what I mean by that um, shortly. It means that the, the, what you would think, the market pressures to secure your applications, to secure your infrastructure and so forth, are not as strong as we might think they, they, they would be. Uh, let's look first at why uh, software development is hard. Here's a list of some uh, technologies that are involved in web development. Uh, apologies if your favorite technology is not there. Um, as I said, to be a software developer, you need some combination of these skills that makes you employable, that makes you valuable to your um, uh, employer. Uh, software, sorry, um, application security requires additional skills on top of that, at least web application security does. And you just don't wake up one day and decide to be an application developer, not nowadays. You don't wake up one day and decide to be an application uh, security specialist. It takes time, it takes a lot of time. So the bottom line is that there's not enough people around with these skills to plan, design, implement, and verify that systems are secure. That's a problem, and we have not addressed it adequately as an industry. So this, in, in addition, the solution is uh, therefore not a pure technical challenge, um, and um, you know, tool providers are looking to provide tools. Um, they're doing marketing. Um, and we, as I said, we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that the right combination of tools is going to solve our, all our problems, i.e. the silver bullet that, um, that we might be looking for. Uh, if, you know, it also, as it's a, in the middle uh, point, it, uh, a solution is going to involve people, processes, skills, and discipline. That means organizational culture. That means it requires a commitment from the top, top down to actually move an organization in the right direction. If you uh, want to ask yourself a question, ask yourself, does application security carry the same influence in your organization as quality assurance does, as a political entity within the company? Now, if you're in the financial industry, the answer is probably yes, it does. If you're not in the financial industry, the answer is probably no. And that's interesting. And finally, as we'll see here, um, I don't believe that the marketplace punishes breaches when they occur. I don't think that um, there's a top-down commitment from the highest levels of management to security as there should be. That may change, and I'll give you some reasons why I think it will change, but right now it's not, it's not there where it needs to be. Uh, managers are very often more focused on getting it out than getting it right. Uh, the focus is, when it does come to security, on compliance and not true security. Um, and then there's some denial. It's never happened here. We've never been breached, right? And that's true, until it isn't. This is an interesting thing. I went to look at how the marketplace punishes companies that have been breached. This is a snapshot from last Friday's uh, tar Target stock price. Closed at uh, $76.12, which, if you look in the red box, is within about 2% of the 52-week high. Apparently, Target's investors are not afraid of the consequences of a breach. Apparently, target investors uh, don't feel any need to punish uh, Target for its 
presumed misdeeds. Who was the victim in the Target breach? Apparently not Target. It was the customers, right? Interesting, I thought. Um, so this actually raises another question. We'll take a look at Sony next. Uh, Sony closed at $27.30. That's uh, pretty much at its 52-week high. Good for Sony investors who don't seem to fear the consequences of a breach. Here's a question for you, though, an interesting debate. Um, did the hackers, um, was the Sony hack a success? Some people will say yes, some people will say no, that's the debate part. But um, I, I, I would ask it this way. Did it discourage companies from doing what otherwise might have been provocative behavior? Did it discourage some companies from doing things that they might perceive as being provocative and therefore shy away from that? I think it did. I think it did. I think a lot of people said, thank God it's not my emails that are out there, right? A lot of corporate executives saying, thank God if that had been us, we'd be in a lot more trouble than, um, I forget the lady's name who just uh, stepped down. But uh, I suspect it was a success from the hacker's point of view. So that being so, if that is so, you can look for more of that, not less of it, right? Which I'm afraid is a pessimistic view on, on things. Another factor, and um, Lance alluded to this is, to some extent, is that attackers attack with seeming impunity. There's not a lot of, at least perceived from the public, punishment for global actors who perpetrate these, um, these breaches. Oh, and last but not least, we have Anthem, which made the news over the past couple of weeks. Um, so you have one that happened a while back, a couple of, maybe a couple of years back. We have one that happened uh, you know, months back, and now we have one that just happened recently. Oh, look, it's pretty much at its 52-week high. Now, this one's interesting because of, purely because of the number of records that were involved in the breach. You probably heard you know, on the order of 80 million records, right? Now, just do the back of the envelope math. That means you're about $100 million in the hole just for notifying people, just, for notify, just to notify everyone and provide them with that life lock protection that they said they'd give everybody. You're $100 million bucks in the hole before you've even looked at the problem. Right? So, I mean, that has to sting, you know what I mean? It's, there's a saying, you know, a few million here, a few million there, a few billion here, a few billion there, and sooner or later it adds up to real money, right? So this is, uh, this, you know, the cost here is significant, but look, you wouldn't know it, according to, the, according to Wall Street. So um, there is a class action suit pending. That could change the outlook on things, depending on the size of that award. This one's a little bit different because credit card numbers, when they get exposed, of course, can be changed but your social security information can't be changed, right? Your social security number, uh, your, you know, your medical history, I don't think that was actually breached, but once that stuff gets out there, it's out there, right? Nothing you can do about it. So the, there may be punitive damages in, uh, in this particular case. So in conclusion to this point, um, it's fair to say that in each case, the market is not pressuring the organization to change its security posture. Investors don't seem to fear the consequences of breach, and perpetrators don't seem to fear the consequences of uh, what you called ROI, which was the risk of incarceration. I have a different ROI I'll talk about in a little while. Okay, so um, as, I, as I sat there, it occurred to me, and pondering this, that you know, um, the crisis we're experiencing has a parallel 30 years ago in software quality. When I started uh, out in my programming career, the world was a tizzy with the software quality crisis, at which point it seemed like we simply, simply couldn't build things that weren't riddled with bugs and problems and defects, and that we couldn't be, do, run a project without uh, it be running over budget and being delivered late and having unhappy customers. Anybody remember those days? Yeah, you don't hear a lot of talk now about the software quality crisis, do you? The, the, the crisis has passed, right? The shadow of crisis has passed. Well, I thought it might be interesting to kind of look and think about what changed in the, qual in, in the organizations to kind of address the quality problem. Um, oh, by the way, this is interesting. You can certainly f draw some parallels here as well. When you talk to this, the, the quality folks, they will sometimes classify security problems as a quality problem. But very rarely will you, when you talk to the security people will they classify a security problem as a quality problem. Um, in fact, I think both are right. A, um, a, a security problem becomes a quality problem when your security requirements are properly documented, right? I'll say that again. A security problem becomes or is a quality problem 
if your security requirements have been properly documented because presumably then they're being tested and that's where you found it or you didn't find it but it's still a quality assurance uh, issue because you didn't find it. And the other um, interesting parallel here is that what is a, a bug? What is a software defect? It's, you know, in the old days it was something that implicitly is wrong. Eh, we didn't write down what it had to be but we know when we're seeing it it's wrong, right? Kind of a similar thing now with the state of a lot of people's security requirements. Well, I know we didn't say don't, you know, you had to encode everything, but that's a cross-site scripting problem, and it's wrong, right? It's like, well, you know, you didn't tell me what to do, so we did what we could. Um, so this is interesting. So let's take a look at what improved software quality. How did we get to the point where it's no longer a crisis? And these are important points. It became a management priority. In some cases, it became part of the mission of the organization or the value statement of the organization. We had the Malcolm Baldridge Award, and we had all the big companies fighting for it, right? The industry embraced project management. Project management was not, it was an existing art, but it was not part of the software development world back in the 80s. And surprisingly so, now that we look back, and it was like, duh, right? And, and, and the, good Im the imposition of good project management into our processes gave us, among other things, the time to do testing, the time to actually come up with test plans and execute them and not squish, because we were late with development, squish the testing down to the point where we had to ship it, even though it wasn't ready, right? So, I mean, that was a key part of it, one that nobody ever saw coming, but over time clearly showed its, its value. Better business analysis. We had to do better a better job gathering, documenting, and verifying requirements. You heard the old joke, you guys start coding, I'll go up front and find out what they want. That's what it was like sometimes, right? I, I, I won't get into the uh, tangent on some of the projects that I worked on back then, but it was like that. Better tools, better testing, better monitoring and reporting, and most importantly, better methodologies and processes. Those are key. Only one or two of those are technology related, right? All right, so now, Fast forward, today, software quality is built into every step of the software development life cycle, is it not? Yeah, it is. And I think that's one of the lessons that we need to take away from this. So, the solution to the software quality crisis was not purely technical, it was evolutionary, not revolutionary. In other words, there was no big breakthrough. It was just we kept plugging away and changing things over time, adopting best practices sharing in the industry until we got to the point where um, things were better. It required systemic change across the entire software development life cycle. So what lessons can we take away from that? Uh, the scope clearly must be the entire SDLC. Uh, project management played a key role. The good news is we don't have to reinvent that. It applies right to everything we do today. We've got that as a, as in, our, in our pocket already. Uh, processes were changed, methodologies, were, methodologies changed, we talked about that. This is an important point, it represented organizational change, and that's hard, right? That means that people's jobs, responsibilities are changing, their roles are changing, it means the culture has to change, it means what people's priorities are have to be shifted, corporate priorities have to be shifted. That's not always an easy thing to do, and it requires a top-down commitment from the highest levels of the company. I think part of the disconnect here is that the highest levels of the company are responding to the marketplace, right? CEOs do not get their bonuses based on the security of their applications necessarily. CEOs get their bonuses because they raised the stock price up to the target that they promised they would when they got hired. I know I'm oversimplifying, but so other lessons. Security requirements are mandatory, are required, right? And, and by that I mean you can't say to your developers later you need to validate all your inputs if there's no requirements as to what those inputs need to look like. Detailed specifications that you can really validate against. You can't implement it if you can't define it. You can't verify it if it hasn't been documented. It's that simple. I think there's, a, there's room for growth, room for improvement, in the requirements, security requirements, gathering documentation and verification. We need checkpoints throughout the entire SDLC. Testing needs to be formalized, security testing needs to be formalized, structured and rigorous. And then finally, we need to train our people. 
It's not just a question of getting the tools into the hands. They need to know how to use the tools. It's not just a question of taking your testers, giving them better tools, and say, test. I think we need to push responsibilities for security back into the developer realm, back into the business analyst realm. There has to be a shared responsibility for this. Um, just to have a schematic that we all agree on in terms of um, the software development life cycle. Um, arguably, we could have 10 different models, but this basically shows us project initiation up here, requirements gathering, design, construction, testing, development, and then maintenance and decommissioning. I'm, I stole a slide from another presentation. That's why it's a little more complicated than that, but you see it. OK, no surprise there. Now let's take a look at the places where we can do something differently to impact security. Project initiation. This is where we're going to make sure, and by the way, this is probably the most important slide of the talk, so I want to make sure I get all my points. Um, project initiation. This is where we're going to build the business case the, and explain the ROI for the security of the application. This is where you get the money, or not for having to have time later to do security requirements, to do security testing, to do developer training for security, right? You don't get the money up front and the time up front. You don't get a secure product, right? So you've got to think about that. You need to justify the ROI, and in this case, the return on investment. You need to make that business case that it's worth the company's investment to spend that extra time. And by the way, security costs, dirty little secret, right? Security costs time and money to build a more secure product than not, right? So let's just get that out there, right? The challenge here is to justify it during uh, the earliest stages of the project. Um, this is also where we might create a budget for training, for data masking, for monitoring, for whatever the other security-related activities might be that we might not think of early on and then creep into scope later and we find ourselves uh, you know, under some pressure. Project planning, if I can step there. Um, this is where we plan for all of those activities that we just described, requirements, testing, uh, the checkpoints, uh, developer training. This is where some of the tools can come into play. Uh, tools like, um, well actually, it's more training than tools. It's uh, re resources like secure web design, um, where we ta teach developers about cryptography, where we teach them about authentication, where we teach them about the things they need to know to actually build um, the, it right the first time. Um, the, uh, the design phase, that's a point where we might interject a security design review, where we have some subject matter experts now reviewing the design, looking for those places where, hey, you know what? Here's a place where you didn't use a parameterized query, and you should have. Hey, here's a place where you're not encoding. Matter of fact, I don't see any place where you're encoding for um, uh, cross-site scripting. Well, we're using .NET. We don't have to. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I actually get that. No, no, no. We're using ASP.NET. It does the encoding for you. No, it doesn't. It does some controls, right, but not all of them. And, you know, that's the conversation that you need to have because they don't know they're going to make these mistakes. Um, the resources that we can pull in from the industry to help us here include OWASP projects, such as uh, the OWASP Developer Guide, the OWASP uh, cheat sheets. People are familiar with these, right? If you're not, you need to go home tonight and, or write down for tomorrow. Look at the OWASP cheat sheets. Look at the OWASP Developer Guide. Look at the OWASP Testing Guide. This is the best resources for the money, <laughs> right? Because they're free and they're written by the people in the industry who have the strongest credentials, and they're real, they're practical. This is not uh, you know, academic stuff. This is really nuts and bolts advice on what you should be doing. Incredible, valuable resource. That's where uh, we can draw on it. In construction, obviously we need to bring static analysis tools into scope. Uh, this is where we need to um, do co selective code inspections. And by the way, but code inspections, it's not your grandfather's code inspection anymore, right? We're going to be using the tools to search through the code for certain patterns to make sure that, for example, every time you go out to the database layer, you are, in fact, using a parameterized query or you're using the database layer, you're not using any um, uh, uh, dynamic SQL, that kind of thing, right? But that's a worthwhile exercise to look for those OWASP top 10 
to look for that CWE 25, right? Uh, make sure that your uh, you know, you, uh, eyes have been on it. Construction is also the place where, again, we can pull in some of the tools from the, um, from the industry. We'll use OWASP again as an example. People familiar with the app sensor project? Fascinating, fascinating idea. The idea is that um, it's like building a web application firewall, designing it into your application. So that your application, as it does its input validation, it doesn't just say, no, that's not invalid. It recognizes the difference between, hey, that you must have made a typing mistake, Mr. User, and I'm under attack because my client never, would never submit something like that to me. And now I'm going to react. I'm going to choose how to react to that, how to respond to that. I'm going to, can't, I'm going to terminate the session. I'm going to block the IP. I'm going to maybe even be proactive and do something else, right? block the account or something like that, right? So App Sensor is both a conceptual how to do it as well as it's a, a reference implementation. They actually this code out there for you, okay? So again, great stuff, cutting edge, best kept secret in appli web application um, design and implementation. So these are the kind of things you have to go and find. Uh, the ES API, are people familiar with that? Enterprise Security API, yeah. Um, there's uh, all kinds of coding patterns there that you can make use of. Running, I mean, code, libraries that you can embed within your application or adapt within your application. Now, I don't see Tom in here, but if, yeah, Tom is, is under his breath, he's muttering, just make sure you read the license, right? Make sure you understand the license, uh, the licensing. It's free, but you have to uh, observe the terms of the license on all of these things. Here's where you also have uh, cheat sheets, right? The cheat sheets come into scope for coding. Uh, as well as design, the code review guide. There's an OWASP code review guide, and there's uh, actually a code base for uh, cross-site request forgery as well. Now, I'm not hitting all of them. This is, I'm not going to bore you with 150 projects, but I'm just trying to pluck out some of the gems and make clear that within this life cycle, there's tools there that you're probably not using that you can integrate into your operations and your, your methodologies and get some real value from at zero cost except for teaching your developers how to use them or t testers how to use them. All right, moving on. Um, in testing, uh, obviously we're testing security requirements, but we also have to do ad hoc testing or, or penetration testing, right? Um, the, uh, uh, I mentioned some of the other tools. Uh, the OWASP, o OWASP has a, uh, a testing environment. It's basically a CD or a number of different forms that you can load, but it's, think of um, like Kali Linux. It's like a, a bootable you know, disk that you can use and has all the tools there already. Um, there's a, um, a web testing framework, which you can think of as a layer above the tools that actually helps you organize your testing to be consistent with um, like the penetration testing engagement standard or the NIST standard or any other standard that, that might be uh, relevant to you. It, it's an organization tool. Um, people familiar with uh, ZAP, proxy attack tool? Yeah, Z attack proxy, right? It's probably the best free tool for penetration testing that you're going to come across. It competes with some commercial tools. I can show you over here, that's, there it is, there's the feature there, there's the feature there, right? And it's free. So there's absolutely no excuse for not uh, integrating some of these things in. All right, enough on that. Uh, during deployment, which is sometimes overlooked um, as, as part of the uh, um, life cycle, uh, deployment is a perfect opportunity to screw up security because you didn't uh, do your roles and permissions properly, right? Or you didn't do a security impact analysis of what it means to put in that tool into that, uh, that, that application into that place. Um, monitoring is another thing we can get wrong uh, at deployment time. Maintenance, right? I think there was a quote on one of these slides that said that no, no software project is so big, so twisted, so complex that maintenance can't make it worse. I thought that was brilliant, brilliant quote. Um, so uh, for maintenance, we need to make sure our maintenance people are trained in security, right? Because we're sort of, you know, we do, a, let's just assume for a moment we do a fantastic job and we build a secure application. Then it goes into maintenance and slowly now the security posture of that is eroding because the maintenance people are not properly trained. They're not regression testing or they're not, uh, you know, keeping the, keeping the application the way it should be. In terms of uh, tools, there's a tool called the um, OWASP Dependency Checker. Anybody familiar with that? That actually looks at your jar files and then compares it to the uh, list of um, vulnerabilities database, and it, it tells you whether or not you're using vulnerable uh, libraries. I don't know about you, but that 
is enormously valuable in a lot of places. And when you see all of a sudden when a company in embraces that and turns that on, everything lights up like a Christmas tree. It's not good. And you're like, oh my God. You panic, right? And it's like, okay, you start addressing it, start addressing it, and you get back to a secure posture. But that, you know, uh, the, the use of insecure components is one of the OWASP top 10, right? Which was the motivation for the project, but it works. So everybody should be using it to the extent that they can. Um, and then finally, in decommissioning, um, people sometimes, organizations sometimes will just decommission an application without considering the security implications of that because some other component was assuming that that thing was there, right? Some other component had a trust relationship with the one that's now gone, and now is left trusting either nobody or somebody that they should, something that they shouldn't be trusting. So we went through the uh, tools. We mentioned some of the code. Some observations, um, and these are kind of random. If they don't, it's not a logical flow, kind of random. Um, Threats and breaches are going to increase because of the militarization of hacking and, unfortunately, the past successes that have happened over, over the, this year and the year previous and so forth. There seems to be little accountability at the national level for APT activities. Regulation, when it is imposed by the government, it levels the playing field for an industry. A lot of times companies will say, well, I don't want to do that because it's expensive. I don't know if my competitors are doing it. It'll reduce my profit margin and so forth. But when the government comes in and says, you have to do this, it establishes a baseline. Everybody has to do it, and now they're not worried about their competition not doing it and getting, a, getting an edge up on them. Uh, large cyber insurance is going to continue to influence what goes on in the software development lifecycle. Why? Because these policies are going to get bigger, they're going to get more complex, and therefore the insurance companies, just like they do in every other industry, they're going to come in and they're going to say, well, you know what, you can get a break on insurance premiums if you do this, that, and the other thing. So you're going to start to see that influence the management from the top down. Organizations that prioritize cybersecurity are less impacted by newer enhanced regulatory requirements when they are imposed. What this means is you can get ahead of the game by seeking security as opposed to compliance, right? Customers have yet to fully vent their frustration. That will be an ugly thing when it happens. The government has yet to fully intervene. The government doesn't li like to see a good crisis go unwasted. Get a good crisis, be wasted, you know what I mean, what he meant. Um, yeah, that's true, and I think what you're going to see is the government intervene in ways that it hasn't previously. It's going to continue to turn the screws on the industries that it is regulating, and I think you're going to start to see new regulation for cyber security, for personal information protection, more about disclosure and so forth uh, going forward. Uh, what conclusions might we draw from this? Uh, greater attention for cyber security at the sea level, that's good. Formalization and prioritization of security throughout the SDLC, I think that's good. So this is what I'm saying. Some, you know, some of these pressures are going to come from places where we didn't necessarily expect them. They will have a beneficial effect. I think that security ultimately will become a business as usual thing in the software development lifecycle, just like quality is. I think, unfortunately, you're going to see new and increased regulation, as I mentioned. You're going to see this cyber insurance industry is going to be a booming industry. More attention is going to be paid to in, uh, IDS and IPS solutions, not just at the um, firewall, at the network level, and at the um, host, on the host, but also within applications. The reason for that is I think companies are coming to think, to realize, based on some of the facts we showed you tonight, that a breach is inevitable. It's not a question of if we'll be breached, it's a question of when. So now some additional focus obviously has to be paid on rapid detection and incidence response, right? So you're going to see that kind of uh, uh, sh uh, sh uh, shift take place as well. Um, I think Lance mentioned things like bug bounty programs. I think you're going to see more like that. Innovative ways of engaging the community to help improve the, so uh, the quality of the products. Uh, you're going to see more spreading of the pain from these retail breaches. The banks are simply not going to continue to absorb these losses. They're going to turn around and impose um, penalties and, and requirements on their um, retail uh, partners. I think you're going to see new and increased uh, personal identity uh, products like LifeLock and things like that because customers are not feeling secure. 
They simply are not, and they really don't have any haven other than these, um, these products. So you're going to see that continue to be a strong industry, at least for the intermediate term. Uh, you'll continue to see the introduction of new and effective tools. That's good. And yay, last but not least, I left the best news. Salary growth for security professionals. All right, finishing up. What can we do, what we actually can do? Train your business analysts, your developers, and your testers. I think that that is not being done properly today. I think there's a lot of, well, we make them watch the video kind of solution, okay? Even in the, you know, again, it's for compliance. It's not for security. We need to train those developers. I've had lots of conversations with, somebody, with, with developers where I say, you can't do that. You can't, you know, we saw one solution, and I could never uh, mention who it is. We saw one solution where the filter was, well, if the incoming string contains or one equals one, then we block it. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's just, it's ludicrous, some of the, you know, some of the things you see. But um, anyway, so the, there's uh, room for more room for uh, training. Uh, we talked about bug bounties. This is important. Reevaluate and enhance your methodologies across the entire SDLC. The analogy, the metaphor here was back in the day when they were, uh, the telephone system was becoming pervasive across the country. And that was the time when you'd pick up the phone and you'd call the operator, the, the central office, and they would plug the wires together and they would complete your call. And depending on the long distance involved, there'd be a lot of operators connecting wires across the country, right? Potentially across the world. Um, and as the growth of the phone system uh, got larger and larger, they realized we're not going to have enough operators because if everybody picks up the phone to make a call, everybody needs to be an operator. You know how they solved that problem? They made everybody an operator. When you dial your phone, you're the operator. Okay, you're doing the routing information and so forth, right? That's how they solve the problem. So I think a similar kind of realignment needs to occur within our industry. Where we look at security and say it's not just the tester's problem. Okay, it's not just the security, the app security's problem. We have to distribute the responsibility for that throughout all of the ver various roles that make up um, software development, application development. Um, evaluate the latest tools, support the industry. Don't be afraid to spend money on tools as well, right? We need to keep those tools, that pipeline coming, right? We need to reward the innovators. We need to reward those people who are advancing the industry. And then last but not least, it says cross-train here, but I, what I really mean is you want to pull in from the developer community, train them in security, and turn them into security um, uh, specialists, because they're halfway there, right? at least in the web application security field. They're halfway there. And last but not least, we got to get more people into this field, right? Uh, one of the organizations I uh, participate in actually has an initiative where they go out to high schools and they try and sell IT to the kids to get them into IT programs, into computer science programs, and so forth. Because without that, I mean, for a while there, guidance counselors were saying, don't go into IT. All the jobs are going overseas. That's chilling. Right? And I think, to be honest with you, I think we're suffering from that a little bit right now. So um, there's another thing that we can, we can do. Um, to wrap up, the as-is is clearly unacceptable. The scope of the problem, I don't think, has been fully acknowledged. Um, the, the improvements required, we've talked about. And I think there's reason to be optimistic. It is a solvable problem. Some of these things are already happening. We've overcome challenges like this before. And I think the insights that we're sharing tonight, I think they're becoming more and uh, more pervasive and, and well understood. So I appreciate everybody's time. That was uh, what I wanted to share with you this evening. Hopefully I convinced you of some of those things. And uh, I would actually um, open the floor to some questions if anybody had questions. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I have gotten into application security about eight years ago. And I was a developer in the 80s and then I some QA was a new thing then. Uh, and I, can, I loved your analogy about you know, this is really just QA for this century. Mm -hmm. um, yet, uh, I found that the efforts that I had in trying to uh, promote distributed application security responsibilities throughout an organization from the beginning, from inception to decommission, it really hinged only, only on a top down CI, uh, CS, CIO down. Capability, and I wonder if, if, and, and there were a lot of organizations that didn't see it as a priority simply because stock price wasn't changing, right? Nobody's really being penalized. 
So I wonder if uh, we might have some success instead of trying to create security as this whole new thing, um, try to somehow sell it internally as an extension of QA that already exists. And how did QA get to become QA? Well, it grew over time and it had this expanding scope. And you know, maybe we can, you know, from a technical perspective, keep some isolation. So co-opt co -opt QA into doing security work as well? I'm all Not for it. <laughs> to do this work, right. but getting it to be recognized at a high level as, as a QA initiative. No, I, I, would, I would endorse that 100%. I think that's part of what I was trying to get at with um, the idea that uh, if with better security requirements, part of that naturally goes into the QA uh, I mean, sphere. That's adopted in many organizations yeah. as a QA initiative to expand itself, and I think that can help. Understood. Good point. Yes, sir. As someone representing QA, I don't know if we have any other quality insurance people in here. Um, I'm actually, this is you, it's a brilliant presentation because it's speaking to me. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to address first, that second slide about why we haven't done it. I didn't see time as a factor. And I've seen it too many times where time becomes the constraint that we pretty much, we're still running up against where... You mean the time to test an application? The time from, the, yeah, the time from beginning secure? to end as a, why didn't we, why there's security vulnerabilities. Um, simply because it's just, I, in my profession, being a tester, I've seen a lot of carelessness because it was just trying to either meet a deadline or silo bugs for a future update. Um, so, and then the other thing I wanted to ask, I didn't see any, how does this whole thing affect mobile? Affect mobile? Yes, because we are, my line of, the company I, I actually work at does both web and uh, native mobile applications for iOS and Android. And I want to see what kind of tool sets we can or exist for that. Because I'm actually, to this gentleman's point, kind of, I want to get transition into uh, making security part of okay. the overall. Yeah, um, so two, two thoughts. One on the time. Um, you know, that is part of, the, we, we mentioned early on in project initiation is where you need to make that time, right? You need to get the money, get the buy-in, and then during planning, allocate sufficient time for testing. So I agree with you. If you don't put enough time into the plan, then that becomes a casualty of, of the development process. With regard to mobile, mobile's kind of you know, came along a little bit later, so the tool set is not as advanced, is not as complete. But I think absolutely everything we're talking about here, at least in this talk, applies to mobile as well. Do we have time for another question? Yes, sir. Uh, that other question. What I've been seeing in some of my <coughs> accounts where um, they're standing up multi-million dollar web projects. The developers don't have any, uh, the, the rapid time to market and the requirements to go live um, are usurping security and are usurping, I wouldn't say the developers, but uh, the marketing team and the, uh, is trumping security. Those, those applications are going to go live mm -hmm. um, and they're not going to be in many cases entirely uh, security approved at they're going to do the best they can. So, so that hasn't changed. Though, right. So right? that's more of an observation than a question, right? Yeah. And, and, yeah. And I, so, it's, so they don't often, uh, often I don't see that the, they have the time they w would like to have to. So right. And how that, do you reflects, that? How do that you? reflects the corporate priorities, does it not? Somebody is deciding or, you know, Im implicitly or explicitly, um, you know, consciously or unconsciously is saying it's more important for us to get this product out the door than it is to worry about whether or not it's secure. Now, that may work sometimes. You know, that may be a perfectly legitimate strategy in some industries. If we're not first, don't come to the table. Don't come to the party. On the other hand, it could be completely the opposite, a disaster in some other application. So, um, that's the only comment I would have to that. Yes, sir. So, on the slide, you showed that uh, the, you started the slide from the very beginning, the initiation phase where you start documenting the security requirement and stuff. But most of the software that is out there is actually software that was built some time back and it's already existing with those security requirements out there. So, how do we solve that problem? That's, it is a different problem to solve. I would agree with that. That's um, sort of a triage kind of thing. You know, look at your application base and figure out what's internet facing, what's internal, what, what, where are the crown jewels, and which applications well, might expose them, and so forth. Yes, you could do that, but right now it's in maintenance. It's out there in the internet, and the well, a risk analysis would still be appropriate, would it not? Yes. 
prior, priority, prioritizing your spend, whatever that spend might be, would still be appropriate, would it not? I mean, you know, to, say, to throw your hands up and say we can do nothing, I don't think is, is acceptable. Unless they pose no risk to the organization, despite the fact that they're insecure. Yes, sir. I've spoken to some QA people about this and said, so here's the OWASP testing guy. You want to, you want to consider this for QA? And, and the answer was, no, no, no. We're just trying to make sure that it met the functional requirements. We're just thrilled that it works. We're going to let security worry about that. Uh, and then I've had customers that have said, you know, we don't want to do this analysis because, you know, the last time we, we, we evaluated our product for security, we found all these <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. That, that's actually kind of funny, and, and that's what I was getting at earlier about, you know, it's like picking mushrooms, you know, you pick the mushrooms, you turn around, you look back, and there's more mushrooms. It's like our goal is not to pick mushrooms and collect them. Our goal is to stop mushrooms from growing, and you've got to go back to the source and educate the developers and make sure they have the tools to make sure that they're producing secure product. I think uh, one more, and we'll wrap it up. Okay, last question. <laughs> and, and if I gave him the misimpression of that, I apologize. <laughs> so, and, and I used to be one for a long time, I still do development, and I think most developers are good guys and girls. And uh, so there's this, like, even if they did all the encoding and, you know, parameterized queries and all that stuff, there's still a, po a part of their job which is to develop the logic of software. Mm -hmm. And them being inherently good guys, they don't know how to think like a bad person. So how do you address that issue, right? Where they're developers, they're inherently good people, but they don't really think about all those fringe cases where a certain piece of logic that they would never consider okay. in a million okay. years. I, I, I understand what you're saying. A um, couple of responses. One is I was a software dev developer myself. I taught software developer web application development for many years. I'm now atoning for my sins. My name is Joe, and I was a developer. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so that, that's, that's one silly comment. But the, the more serious one is, um, yeah, I think there's still room for education for the developers. But I think, again, there's, there's more education for the QA people, too, because it's testing, not just testing against requirements. It's testing for security. We want to broaden that role so it's not just following page after page of the test plan. It's also there's some, some aspect of that that's penetration testing or ad hoc testing against the application. So um, test, uh, developers don't make very good testers for exactly the reason that you described. They're more concerned. That they, they're trained to make it work, to figure out how to make it work. They're not trained, how do I break it? How do I, you know, um, how do I uh, corrupt the design, the logic, you know what I mean? Um, one of the things that we do and we, we want to penetration test is we want to look for the assumptions that the developers have made and then break them, reverse them, and see what happens. Just to see what happens, right? Developers don't think like that, right? It's a different skill set. I agree with that. Bill, last question. You just a comment on that. One of the things that a security, maybe a security architect, or just somebody who's security aware in a development scenario can do that's very helpful is when they develop a threat model for an application, particularly when they do the asset-based threat model. Like, what are the things in here that are worth stealing, worth manipulating, what can go wrong, those kind of things. To then educate the development team on that threat model with exactly the kind of wording and simple language that you would use when you're trying to get the CIO to understand it, or the CEO to say, this is where they will steal money from us in this way, or this is where they will get this key information. <clears throat> what I found when I've done that with the development team is that their eyes bug out as they suddenly realize that this system's main threat is a broker who might steal from another broker, not um, the bad guys from the outside, for example. And, and that it's just a real, it, that gets them to think, and it's, it's not security, it's suddenly, uh, Wow, logical, and, and then they start seeing it in their application, they visualize it, and they start coming to you and saying, uh, what about this, or what about that? So just an idea. Yeah, excellent point, excellent, I have nothing to add to that. So, oh. so, so with that, I think that's an exact uh, summarization for OWASP. Outside, before I met somebody who I haven't seen literally in seven years, 
that tonight is a 10-year anniversary of me running these OWASP things. He's like, you know, I remember back in 2004 when you were doing this. I'm like, yeah, I'm still kind of doing the same thing. But, but thinking, thinking evil and being good is sort of what our sort of ethics are, right? That's kind of where like you 50 people in the room here at 8.30, uh, you know, this is kind of that group of people that we get together as often as possible and exchange ideas and, and debate these issues. So with that, our next meeting is across the river uh, at PMB Bank. Um, there will be opportunity there to collaborate and do the exact same thing we did tonight. Uh, it's really important to have new blood, new contact, new information, to people to step up and speak. If you have great content, submit a talk. Uh, this is sort of a safe place, right, where that we can collaborate and say, yeah, I, I don't like that, or I don't agree with that, and have that conversation, right? So tonight, appreciate everyone coming out. I'd like to thank KP and Gate. Thank Joe. Thank you. Thank you.